So as Marinella correctly said, the, the main purpose of our study was rather than providing a, a, an estimation of the numbers related to the three target was uh, aimed at evaluating the impact that this pack of measure had on the different economic levels of Europe. In order to do that, uh, it was inevitable to consider the impact that this pack of measure had on the European competitiveness of the industrial sector. Uh, we've decided to focus on the manufacturing sector for two different reasons. The first one was that it accounts for, today it accounts for about 15.2% of the European GDP, while in uh, 2000 it accounted for 18.5%. So this is a data itself, by the way. And uh, the second element that uh, uh, bring us to, to consider this sector was the fact that it's particularly intensive from an energetic point of view. Well, if you see uh, the data on the graph, it clearly shows that uh, the downtrend of the European competitiveness, according to official UN data, started well before the introduction in 2009. You can see it from the purple line. Uh, of the introduction of the packet. So uh, actually, um, after 2009, in, in 2009, we clearly see a stabilization in the downtrend of the competitiveness loss. Uh, we can just assume that it's a case and is not related to the introduction of, of the packet. Well, on the contrary, energy price, as everyone knows, uh, affected and currently is affecting the uh, European competitiveness. Uh, Electricity price in particular in Europe are about three times higher than in the US, for example. It is easy to understand how much this measure can influence negatively the European competitiveness. But this has a positive outcome on the contrary. Uh, together with the introduction of the 2020 package, it forced, let's say forced, the European uh, uh, industry to invest strongly in the so-called key enabling technologies. Um, they are the technologies that can support from a practical and technical and technological point of view the conversion toward a green economy. As you can see from uh, these data related to the, the number of patents that the Europe as a whole registered in the last few years, you can clearly see that uh, in, uh, for example, energy technologies, transport and turbines and pumps that are fundamental to obtain ad actual uh, advancement in the uh, renewable technology, uh, Europe has the world main rule. Uh, um, the 2020 package was expected to have positive impact on consumer as well, on the people, not just on industry. Uh, in order to do that, we've analyzed uh, two, uh, we think, uh, outstanding examples of how much the uh, renewable incentives um, included within the package, directly or indirectly, affected the uh, energy price for consumer, the final electricity price. Well, we see uh, the, the most outstanding data are related to Italy and Germany, probably. When you see that, for example, in Italy, in 2008, only 4% of the electricity price was related to the uh, incentive to renewable energy sources. Now this number accounts for about 18%, so more than four times more. Uh, in Germany, uh, the initial number was higher. In uh, 2002, the Germany, uh, Germans used to pay about 16.7% of their electricity bill to to provide support to the renewable implementation, while now that number doubled. And uh, Germans are actually paying 34% of their, of their electricity bills to support the renewable energy. But the, the, the package, the 2020, was not meant just to support um, a reduction or a stabilization of energy price that we saw uh, won't work, by the way. But it was, was also meant to, um, to address another fundamental issue related to the so-called energy question. Uh, I'm referring to the energy poverty issue. Uh, we can consider the energy poverty as the share of population who cannot afford uh, to keep their home warm if needed. Um, these two pictures clearly shows the first one is, by the way, is related to the to the percentage of people that um, in in uh, in the member states cannot afford to keep their home warm. The second one um, shows uh, the, the the percentage of utility bills arrests. 
in, uh, in the EU member states. Uh, well, from these pictures, unfortunately, we should uh, understand, we should consider, we should think that the, uh, the package, the 2020 package, was not, was unable to produce, uh, to overcome the problem. So it wasn't effective in this case. Externalities. Uh, albeit, usually, as you know, externalities are quite hard to quantify um, themselves. We try to, to provide you a couple of key figures in relation to, to this, trying to let you understand um, how positive was the, the, the introduction of the packet from this point of view. Uh, the first one is related to the so-called no-action scenario in relation to the climate change. So the, the, the research question of this study was, the, the, from which we took this, this simple graph was, what will happen to the world GDP uh, if the climate change will occur, uh, let's say, on an average magnitude? Uh, well, these data are strongly conservative, and uh, it clearly says that uh, by 2050, at least 0.5% of the world GDP will be lost as a, as a direct, not indirect, but just direct consequence of the climate change. And trust me when I say that these numbers are conservative. Um, <clears throat> another really important data in relation to the exter positive externalities of the, from the introduction of the packet was uh, twofold. The first one was uh, that the EU emission target uh, is helping and will help reducing the cost related to the uh, reduction of other pollutant, other atmospheric pollutant. Uh, from f by between 2.6 and 3.6 billion euros about 2020. In addition to that, we should uh, we should consider that uh, thanks to directly thanks to the introduction of this uh, packet of measure, um, the European institution will save between 3.3 and 7.6 billion euros by 2020 as uh, um, healthcare expenditure saving. So given the improved health condition of European people, thanks to the introduction of this measure, the European institution, us, in last analysis, will save money to, to provide to our healthcare. OK, but now we, we've briefly tried to provide you a, a really quick overview of, uh, let's say, the short term until 2020. But what happened if we try to shift our point of view uh, from the short term to the mid long term, let's say by what, what will happen by 2030, by 2040? Uh, can Europe still lead the fight against climate change? And what will be the cost? In the next few slides, I will try to provide a very brief idea of, what, of how will be the, the, the future energy scenario in the next 30 years. Well, US, as everyone knows, is from a practical point of view, already independent from an energetic point of view. And by 2017, the, uh, the US will become the first, the world's first oil producer, thanks to the massive investment in, in shale gas and light light oil that, that they have been doing the last few years. This was a precise, a bold, a strong decision that they made from a political point of view and that they're persuading, that they're following. Uh, Brazil, on the contrary, uh, put great investment on its renewable uh, industry. And it's, it, it is estimated that by 2035, 80%, more than 80% of the Brazilian electricity will be sourced from renewable sources. China, everyone knows about China. China is, a, is among the world's greatest importer of coal, but they are still diversifying their, their, their uh, energy sources. They are, uh, it is, calculated from the International Energy Agency that by 2035, the China will invest in renewable energy more than Europe, Japan, and United States together. This is an outstanding number, if you think. Mid Middle East, instead, will continue investing in uh, profitable, I would say, oil industry, given that uh, the oil will continue having a fundamental role even within the, the mid- and long-term energy scenario. And where is Europe? What, what, what's the European agenda in relation to this? Well, unfortunately, I should say this is Europe in the, in the European, uh, in the International Energy Agency projection. Uh, well, we see the first picture highlighting that Europe in the next 20 years, by 2035, will lose about 
10%, 10% of the share of global export for energy intensive goods. This provides you the, the magnitude of this event if you consider that this sector provides about 20% of the global industrial output of Europe and employ about 25% of European. So you can imagine what it means in terms of, of impact, of ne negative impact, the, this loss of 10% of the competitiveness. Uh, furthermore, if you consider that Europe, fortunately, in this case, reduced significantly his greenhouse gas emission, uh, reduced his contribution to climate change from about 19% uh, in 1990 to the, the current 11% to, the, to, an to an expected 4 to 5% in 2030. This provides you the idea of the uh, hardness of the uh, challenge that Europe has to face in order to lead, to actually lead the, the climate agenda. I will quickly go to our conclusion. Um, the, the data we showed you clearly say, clearly highlight how the 2020 package and the climate and energy agenda in general did not affect negatively the European and social condition. Uh, on the contrary, it contributed to build the foundation for a better Europe, definitely. Uh, more employment, more investment in research, less dependency on fossil fuel, and more health for citizens. Europe truly believe in the importance of fighting climate change and gave the world an example. But is it enough? Are, are we thinking that is enough? Uh, the EU Commission, I will uh, refer to a brief sentence of the EU Commission that a few years ago included within its policy. The Commission said the 2020 target represent an integrated approach to climate and energy policy that aim to combat climate change, increase the EU energy security, and strengthen its competitiveness. They continue saying this, the, 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 the objective, are also headline target of the European 2020 strategy for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Think of this keyword. This reflects the recognition that tackling the climate change and energy challenge contribute to the creation of jobs, the generation of green growth, and the strengthening of European competitiveness. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the concept of green growth. This is the green growth paradigm. Well, we think from a political point of view, we try to, rather than providing a suggestion from a technical point of view, we, we try to, to transfer you a message. This message is that, is that if Europe will be able to rediscover the innovative spirit and the strong political will that drove, that inspired this green paradigm, the definition of this agenda, we will be able to, to win this battle. We will be able to lead, actually, and effectively, the international climate negotiation. There is a strong need for bold and resolute policies and choices that should be less influenced by Strong, but by strong and but low but, but small group of interest, and this is the only way to, to win the future challenges. From from a very briefly from a technical point of view, uh, the new set of target that the EU introduced a few days ago, uh, they definitely go in the right direction. But what is energy efficiency? Energy efficiency is the most effective instrument that Europe has to reduce its industrial competitiveness gap with other states such as US, you saw the difference, the gap in energy price. Especially in the new member states where the potential for obtaining these energy efficiency improvement are great, we should invest there, we should invest there. We definitely need more harmonization in, in our energy policy. It's, um, it's unbearable, it's unbelievable that Germany has different policies from Italy. Are we European or are we Italian, German and French? Let me finally say that uh, I was a student when we were talking about a common European electricity grid. And trust me when I say that it's not a matter of lack of technology or lack of technique to obtain this objective. It's just, it's just a matter of, of deciding it from a political point of view. Let me, let me just close saying with a, with a provocation said that we also need to rethink the fuel uh, direct or indirect incentive. Thank you. Just to say a few words uh, explaining the, the, the goal of this meeting uh, th this morning. 
I think it's very interesting what uh, Marinella and David said, illustrating very briefly. Uh, uh, great job they've done. Thank you very much, and very well explained. Uh, because the the title stuck in the middle, uh, I think is very appropriate on a situation here in Europe uh, where we have to decide if Europe has to be a leader on climate, environment, and energy, or just a follower. Uh, while uh, the, the 2020 uh, strategy, both, because 2020 is a, a rendezvous uh, in six years' time, and 2020 20, were the three targets illustrated. And the two issues, the economic uh, 2020 strategy and the green and development and growth and jo pro-jobs strategy uh, called 2020-20 uh, in terms of energy efficiency, renewables, uh, and reduction of emissions should be, should be strictly linked uh, in order to improve the European growth and European jobs. And the European political role, that was another great goal of the European Union uh, to be, to be uh, uh, as I was saying, a leader in an international community about climate, environment, and, and energy. But today, what we see is that uh, maybe or probably just a US-China deal can make a difference. Because uh, uh, jointly, US and China account for um, about 50% of the emission. And it's very likely that US and China are going to decide to go alone. And not in the framework of an international agreement like was Kyoto, like should be Kyoto II, the second Kyoto agreement, something that should be uh, discussed or decided in 2015 in Paris. So Europe has a great responsibility. It is very interesting to discuss that today in Berlin because the European Union is right now discussing what to do about this 2020-20 strategy, how to redefine the goals, how is it useful for European countries and population, industries, competitiveness, jobs, what is more useful for a European contribution to the global community that, as you know, of course, is increasingly aware of the future impact of the climate change on the real life, on the economy, uh, on the disruption that would occur if the emission uh, would not be under the levels that the IPCC, Interna Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, established as uh, a decisive threshold not to trespass about 2% of emission growth. So, is Europe a leader or a follower? Uh, how to protect also the European interest in terms of production and not carbon and production leakage. While Europe is going to import back from the countries where this production are done, the pollution that affects the world but is concretely made in Far Eastern or other developing countries. So we don't have any more this production for environmental reasons, but this production are uh, <laughs> effectively uh, done in other countries and European countries import this production made through a, a, a clear breaking 
of the same rules we established. So in this very moment, Europe is uh, on, on underway to decide what to do, how to reshape the 2020-20 strategy. So the debate uh, today is very interesting because you, you're going to hear some politician, you're going to hear some very prominent expert in the different areas of this uh, um, engaging challenge, and you are going to hear some proposal and solution right now when Europe is about to decide what to do in this changing scenario. So I think it's very interesting. And I would like to ask uh, Jan Werling, uh, who has been uh, the leader of the Green uh, uh, French movement, the Green movement uh, Les Ecolos en France, uh, and today is the uh, spokesperson for the MoDem, uh, an important political party in France. So he has at the same time a political vision and a green one. Please, Jan. Yeah. 